to the last of our four-part series, Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief, or ESSER, Roundtable Discussions. My name is Tracy Helmbrecht, and I am the moderator for this roundtable discussion. To recap, we began in Episode 1 discussing the behind-the-scenes activities and lessons learned in the Communications Department during the COVID-19 closure. Then we transitioned in Episode 2 to Buildings and Grounds and a glimpse into safety and security protocols during the pandemic. Episode 3 included the logistics behind transportation and food services during the pandemic. And today, in our final episode, we have with us Betty Airy, Supervisor of Payroll, and Courtney Hale, the Interim Executive Director of Talent Management. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. And I know that, like those before you, you have a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with our CCS community on how your individual departments pivoted during the COVID-19 closure. So let's get started. Um, let's start with a brief introduction into your departments and how your department supports teaching and learning. Who'd like to take that first question? I can take it. So um, the talent team is comprised of uh, human resources uh, individuals that support uh, the employment of our employees within the district. So while we're not necessarily in the classroom, what we do is support our teachers, um, you know, whether it's leave of absence or benefits or, you know, they get a promotion and need to be entered into the system, um, compensation, all of those different things, we want our teachers to be able to focus on our students. And so as we manage these functions, we want to manage them as efficiently as possible so that a teacher doesn't have to step out of her classroom and say, hey, my benefits were cut off or, hey, my leave of absence didn't go through correctly. We're behind the scenes streamlining those processes so our teachers and staff can focus on doing their job, which is, you know, supporting our, our children. And the function in payroll is to make sure that all of our employees, teachers, and support staff receive their pay timely. We rely very heavily on the input that Courtney just spoke about because they call us if they think their pay rate isn't correct, and that is uh, dependent on what they provide. So, yes, our big mission is to make sure that every two weeks people are paid correctly. Um, and I know that for so many of us, when um, the governor came on March 13th, 2020, and basically shut down the state, including all of the schools, um, it caused everybody to pause. Can you just bring us back to that day and what, when you heard the news that we were closing, everybody was going to go home, um, what went through your mind as it relates to how your departments operate and the changes immediately that were going to have to be made to make sure that we have continuity of um, our human resources and our payroll? We immediately had a meeting with representatives from HR and the treasurer's office to discuss how we were going to handle calamity pay for a lengthy time, the three weeks initially defined. And we also had to consider our um, supplemental coaches for athletics. They had a contract. How were we going to manage pay for them when the seasons were suspended? What were we going to do about paying the part-time hourly people, teachers, and subs, because they all were depending on employment through the end of the school year? Yeah, and we also had a lot of <clears throat> questions to think about with, like, different job classifications. So, you know, a teacher going home is different from, you know, a custodian or a bus driver whose job can't be done remotely. And so how did we, you know, how were we going to, you know, address those different things? So that was interesting. And then adding another layer to it was the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. It's been a while. I, I remember it's FFCRA. Um, but, you know, that was um, legislation that occurred that basically gave time off if you, you know, got COVID. And so we had to come up with a plan to implement, um, you know, this piece of legislation and how are we going to do that remotely? So 
one of the things that was super exciting and not it was kind of like the silver lining in the cloud was that while we were going through all of this, it really helped us to streamline and automate a lot of processes. So, you know, when I first started with the district, a lot of things were being done manually and on paper. This pushed us into using and leveraging technology to continue to, you know, keep the, the operations going. And to support that, we had to uh, modify our system to add special pay types to manage the legislated pay for the COVID. So that kind of gets into my next question about systems and structures that had to be created. Um, that's obviously what was needed for remote. And I remember um, when we transitioned into hybrid, we had these nice little charts made up of different <coughs> positions and you know who was coming in on what days and at what time and all of those things. And those charts obviously did not just create themselves. So can we talk about, you know, you, you've got it down for remote, Right, I feel like we we had just gotten our our feet firmly planted. Everybody was going, okay, I understand this remote. Then we shifted to hybrid. So, what was that like for your departments, where you had some staff coming in on some days and still being remote on other days? I mean, for our team, I think it was difficult because of the fear still, you know, a lot of people were still fearful of, um, you know, coming into contact with someone that had the virus. And so, you know, we were still isolating. Um, and so coming back in, it definitely was a little frightening. And it took a little bit of time for us to kind of get over that fear. But you know, Fear is kind of what's the worst possible thing that could happen. And you think about that and hold on to it. And then once we got back and we started getting more comfortable and realizing, OK, it's not as bad as we thought it was, um, you know, and honestly, I think that it really did help us to kind of lift our spirits, being able to interact and see one another. You know, we were in boxes for, you know, however long we were virtual. And so it was nice to be able to just see someone physically again um, and not just being so isolated and by ourselves in our homes. For our office, one week is processing week, the other week is pay week. So my staff was actually a hybrid the entire time. I was in the office almost every day. My special assistant was there almost every day and my secretary. So during processing week, depending on how far we were into the process and who they were responsible for paying, they would come in um, a few days. We didn't have laptops for everyone when this started. They had desktops, so they were having to use their own equipment at home. We now have laptops for everyone. Uh, so that was a change because of COVID. Um, and that's how we were able to keep, keep people paid. We came up with special email boxes for extended service project summary submission and stipend submission. And previously, we were receiving paper with um, live signature, and we had to adjust to an electronic process, which we are still using today. So some, it sounds like some of those changes that we were forced into um, have actually been worthwhile and keep and like you said Courtney streamlining a process that forced us to really think about uh, the way we do things Absolutely. and how how can we change it for this and sometimes you know going back to normal means a new normal right because we found something that works much better um, so those were just some of the permanent changes. Were there any other permanent changes that came about because of ESSER funding? 100%. Um, so one of the, uh, again, silver linings in the cloud was we were able to obtain a third party administrator for our leave of absence processing. So during COVID, because of FFCRA and all of these you know, different leave requests, 
we realized, well, I don't, I wouldn't say we realized, I think our team had realized a while ago that, you know, we needed to streamline some of these processes. Um, but I think that it shined a light on some of the um, inefficiencies of how we process leaves. And so we were able to utilize ESSER funding to um, obtain this third party administrator, which is Broadspire. Um, and it's been, uh, they've been with us, I think, for two years years now. Um, and so that was a major, major change in how we managed our leave of absence process. You know, um, previously there were only two employees managing it. Everything was done like on paper and in folders. Um, and so, you know, thinking even about customer service, you know, we have almost 10,000 employees almost everyone is eligible for leaves. If you have people calling back to back and there are only two people answering or you're getting all of these emails, like the time, the wait time just to talk to someone or get something processed is, you know, um, long. And again, we want people to focus on being able to, you know, get back into the classroom so that they can focus on their students. So, you know, if you have this inefficient process and a person is ill or they're taking care of someone that's ill, you know, it really doesn't make for a good experience. So being able to um, get this TPA was a game changer. There are so many customer service reps that can help that there's barely any wait time. Your questions are always going to be answered. And on top of that, you still have our leave of absence team there to support, um, you know, um, and provide that white glove service. So that was one of the major permanent changes that came about. One of the other changes was the funding of our um, building subs. So a lot of people don't know that our building substitutes actually were funded through ESSER, and that's how we were able to, you know, start um you know, the building sub functionality. And so, you know, prior to COVID, we didn't have building subs. They were itinerant day-to-day -day subs. And we were able to, um, you know, kind of leverage this new way of looking at how substitutes support our buildings. And that came from ESSER funding. That's fantastic. Were there any changes in payroll that came because of the ESSER funding? We didn't have changes because of ESSER funding, but we did also um, create an opportunity to make an appointment so that we could research that before we responded to people. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't necessary for them to come in. We could manage it electronically. Prior to COVID, we would have people that would show up at our customer service counter without us knowing anyone was coming. Yeah. That is actually a really good point because when I started, you know, there would be a line of people just waiting to talk to us, you know, and so we'd be, you know, in the middle of processing something and then, you know, there would be people at the door. It wasn't always safe. And now, you know, we are a closed space because if you think about it, you know, the information that we have on our laptops, you know, it's social security numbers, people's addresses, you know, their personal information. Um, and so it's not necessarily safe to have, uh, you know, employees walking through, you know, that space when there's so much personal information up. And so you're right, we don't ever have walk-ins unless it's for fingerprints and those are done, you know, by um, via scheduling. So that definitely was a major change. Um, you know, the, I think the virtual um, ability to leverage uh, just like the virtual technology also changed the game for us. I know, you know, before COVID, we weren't using Teams to chat with one another. But, you know, once we went remote, we had to, you know, use that uh, mode of communication. And now we're still using it um, as a district. And it's not just HR, but I can get on Teams and see if someone's available and just send them a quick chat, um, you know, regardless of their location. And that wasn't something that we were doing previously. Or, you know, even with our benefits team, you know, we would would go um, out and physically help people enroll in their benefits. Well, you know, during COVID, we couldn't be in person. And so we had to figure out a different way to do it. And so we were able to do like, you know, a call center only. And we've gone to that solely now because we realized that that being in person wasn't as efficient. Now, we still go out there to answer questions and things like that, but we're able to use and leverage technology to make it a more efficient process for us as well as for our employees. One of the other things we had to address was the change in the law that occurred because of COVID that once someone works 21 days remotely, 
you have to apply the municipality local tax where they're working. So we had to set that up in our system. We had to set up another pay type for remote so that the system would automatically calculate that. And we just started from day one because with the number of employees we have to count when they hit 21 days would be impossible. It reminds me um, during the, the closure and remote, I was in a meeting uh, where we, somebody had said, I can't wait to get back to normal. And we had this whole discussion about, but do we need to go back to normal? Are there lessons that we can learn during this time period and, and maybe have an improved normal? And I, that's what I'm hearing both of you say is that, yes, we're back in person. We have an improved normal in some cases and the pandemic and the ESSER funding helped us pivot and make those changes maybe faster than we would have liked, maybe uh, <laughs> with not as much prep time, but but we made it, we made it through. Um, one of the, I think, proudest things that I learned in my research for these um, roundtable discussions was that we did not miss a single payroll during the entire shutdown. No, we didn't. Um, and that is something to be very, very proud of. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you manage that? I have a very dedicated staff that I can count on, and they know the schedule, they know what they're responsible for, and they stepped up and they made it happen. It was all hands on deck. That's, that's what I remember, all hands on deck. And it was, um, it was actually refreshing to see everybody give grace to everybody else, right? Because we were all in the same boat at the same time. Yeah. It was definitely a difficult time for us, but, you know, HR and payroll work hand in hand. You know, our information flows from, you know, one piece of the system to their piece of the system and back. And so, you know, I can definitely um, attest to, like, your team and just how hard you guys work, whether it was in the pandemic before now, um, you know, and I've always tried to show my appreciation to you guys because you guys kill it and I appreciate every two weeks being able to you know pay my bills on time so thank you Betty yes, and team yes. because you guys definitely go above and beyond and we're always you know just trying to find ways to help make your lives easier uh, because you know the work that we do impacts one another it sure does Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, ladies, for sharing uh, your insights. And um, it has been a pleasure to have this time with you. Are there any other final thoughts about ESSER funding and about your departments that you'd like to share with us? Honestly, I mean, I think I, for me, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to realize some of the things that we had been imagining, you know, um, and, and thinking about for so many years, but saying, like, how do we fund this, you know, um, with Broadspire, again, there were multiple times that we went to, you know, our senior leaders and said, you know, here's this proposal. And the question was, where is the funding coming from? So being able to utilize and tap in, you know, to those ESSER funds really changed the game for not only the way that we administer our leave of absences, but also the experience that our employees get, which is extremely important to us. So, you know, I'm just sitting here kind of um, in a state of gratitude for those opportunities. You know, there were some projects that we were able to do um, you know, because of those funds that are permanent, some of them, you know, we aren't able to continue funding and that's okay as well. You know, we will continue to pivot because, you know, we are an extremely resilient community and, you know, we always find a way. So I'm just grateful for that opportunity and honest, honestly grateful even for going through that storm because I think that we all came out better. I think we learned lessons personally about ourselves, about our teams, about, you know, our community. And I feel like as a district, we rallied together to make it happen. And so I feel like we're sitting in a better position, even though we went through the storm, you know, the sun is back out and, and we're here together talking and reflecting on, yeah, the storms are on that. Stronger, That's right? right. Doesn't feel like it at the time, yeah. but we always come out stronger. And I will say that the CCS community is very resilient, um, whether it's the teacher 
teaching and learning side, the operations side, um, the HR payroll. Uh, we, we all need to come together. We do come together. And I think the pandemic showed that greatly. So thank you ladies so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this four part series and have a better understanding of how our operations teams worked collaboratively, effectively and efficiently to ensure all students are highly educated, prepared for leadership and service and empowered for success as a citizen in a global community, whether that be in a remote, hybrid or in-person educational setting.